So our final speaker uh, is Dr. Joseph Sperano, who's a professor of medicine in the Department of Oncology and also of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Women's Health at Einstein. And he's the Associate Chair of the Department of Oncology at the Montefiore Medical Center. Dr. Sperano is a leader within the New York area in terms of a number of cooperative oncology trials groups as well as nationally. And uh, he has really spearheaded some very, very important clinical trials that address some of the toughest questions that are raised by some of the radiologic and surgical findings. Uh, he'll tell us a little bit about uh, some of these trials, about the various chemotherapies that are available, as well as some at the uh, investigational stage. Dr. Sperano. Thank you. So you, Dr. David has detected the cancer. Dr. Montgomery has rendered the patient cancer free. So my job is to keep the patient cancer free for the rest of their life. And so um, I don't think either of my colleagues would be upset uh, with me by saying that I, I probably have the hardest job of all for two reasons. Number one, our treatments are not as effective as they need to be. And number two, we really don't have very good ways of identifying who's benefiting from what treatment. Um, so you've, you may have heard the, the term personalized medicine um, recently, and really what it's about is delivering the right treatment with, uh, to the right patient at the right time. And that's what we've been focusing a lot of our efforts on uh, within the last decade. So you've heard about the clinical care and, um, and some, a little bit about what I'd like to talk about now is the research, research infrastructure at Montefiore and, and Einstein. You've heard about the ex excellent model that we have for multidisciplinary care that includes state-of-the-art facilities and that it includes um, a culture of excellence in terms of patient care and service to, to our patients and to the physicians who refer uh, our patients to us. But there's also a infrastructure that supports clinical research, uh, including an NCI-designated cancer center in affiliation with a major cooperative group that conducts very large-scale clinical trials, and also a smaller group within the New York area that conducts smaller trials with uh, innovative agents. But what's really also critical is a collaboration between the clinicians that you've heard from and the scientists at, at the Einstein College of Medicine. And I'll, and I'll describe a few of those collaborations. So really, the, the Einstein Cancer Center is sort of at the hub of these interactions, which include these large research organizations, such as the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, the New York Cancer Consortium, other organizations, and then uh, the investigators at Montefiore Medical Center, Jacoby, and other uh, institutions. One of those organizations is the New York Cancer Consortium, which is an organization that I've been involved with, with the last, for the last few years, which essentially includes all of the major medical centers in New York, with the exception of Memorial Sloan Kettering, because they have their own um, uh, program that's funded by the National Cancer Institute. But it's, the focus here is to, to test new drugs. It's funded by the uh, NIH. And we have about 60 to 70 drugs uh, uh, that we're uh, charged with testing. These are the other uh, centers that are uh, funded to, to do this work. Uh, currently, we have nine active trials with five new trials pending, including three trials in breast cancer. So breast cancer is a very important part of our portfolio. So what I'll review briefly is, uh, what I'll focus on is our efforts to discover new therapies and targets, to combine these, what we call target agents, uh, with standard therapies, and then defining molecular signatures that can predict response to therapies. Well, it was about 31 years ago that Dr. Susan Horowitz from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine first discovered the mechanism of action of a drug called Taxol. Uh, this drug was um, initially derived from the bark of a tree, and it was a very complex molecule that had to be soluble. It was instable in water and had to be solubilized in something um, essentially castor oil, uh, and then infused in, in patients' veins. It was so dangerous to give that we had to administer. Uh, it was an investigational drug when I was in my training between 1986 and 1988. And it was so dangerous to give, we had to um, administer it in the hospital. We had to give it as a slow infusion over 24 hours. And we ac I actually had to sit, and my colleagues who were in training had to sit at the patient's bedside for the first hour of the infusion because patients would un uh, um, unexpectedly develop these um, fatal allergic reactions. Um, and so uh, as you might imagine, it was a little um, nerve wracking. Uh, and I witnessed a few of those reactions. However, there were responses seen um, with this agent, including patients with breast and ovarian cancer. The drug companies gave up on it and gave it actually to the National Cancer Institute. Uh, 
and we developed it through the National Cancer Institute um, system. And it took 31 years, but we finally figured out the right, right way to give the drug. The drug was eventually FDA approved, and it took 31 years between discovering the mechanism of action to showing the right way to give it in the treatment of early stage uh, breast cancer. Um, so clearly we need to, although this represents important progress, we clearly need to speed things up uh, and find better ways to, to uh, identify new agents and which benef patients are benefiting from those agents. Uh, another uh, agent that we were involved with in, in the early phases included a drug that at the time didn't have a name. It was called BMS 247550, but it was uh, 12 years before uh, w our group published uh, experience on how to safely give this drug with, um, until we completed a randomized trial that showed the value of this drug in treating patients with uh, advanced breast cancer. And this led to this drug being um, approved by the FDA for advanced breast cancer two years ago, and it's now being tested for early stage breast cancer. So I've talked to you about um, identifying uh, new drugs. What about new targets? Well, so we can uh, accomplish this also by um, going back to tumors that have been stored. Anytime uh, Dr. Montgomery or her colleagues cut a tumor out, it gets sent to a pathology lab, and it does not, after it's examined, it's not discarded. It's actually put in wax and stored. And, um, and part of our research enterprise in the cooperative group process, uh, some of these specimens are then sent to a central bank for patients who agree to participate in clinical trials, and we can go back and study them and then associate uh, the characteristics of these tumors with long-term outcomes after 10, 15, or 20 years. And in one of those experiments, we looked at the expression of a panel of 270 genes with a particularly um, difficult form of breast cancer to treat. It's called triple negative breast cancer that occurs in about 15% of all women. Um, triple negative refers to the fact that it lacks expression of estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. And it means that chemotherapy is really the only treatment that we have for it. And we found that a completely unexpected finding in that increased expression of something called GRAB7 was associated with a twofold higher risk of recurrence compared with low expression and that this relationship was linear, so that the higher level of expression, the inc higher risk of recurrence. I then shared this information with one of my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Parekh Kenny at Einstein, and he has an interesting model where he can take um, cancer, ce uh, cancer cell lines and grow them and, um, into, into certain types of structures. Some of these cells will th uh, grow into what look like normal structures. Others will fail to grow into normal structures. And he can study them in vitro. And we were able to get an inhibitor of this specific gene called GRAB7. And what he showed was that if you, uh, if you take these cells and you grow them in plates, and then you essentially sc scratch a pipette and create uh, a gap, uh, and so you see this, this gap between the cancer cells, uh, if you then treat these cells with, uh, with a control, uh, with, with nothing or with just uh, an inert substance, you see the cancer cells grow right back and fill in that space. But when you inhibit, when you uh, use an inhibitor in this trip for this triple negative cell line, uh, which expresses GRAB7, you can prevent the cancer, cancer cells from spreading. He uh, also showed um, that, uh, and I'm going to try and get this to work, because it's, this is the prettiest picture I have, that if you grow these cells Uh, this is what they normally look like in culture after a certain period of time. So they start from these small colonies uh, and they grow into these larger colonies. And then if you treat them with this inhibitor of GRAB7, you prevent the cells from being able to, to grow nearly as effectively as they, as they did before. So this, uh, we're hoping that this could turn out to, to into a lead that might result in an effective treatment for, um, for this refractory type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And what Dr. Kenny and his colleagues are now doing is um, trying to identify a, uh, a, a chemical structure that will, that will inhibit GRAB7 and get into the cells.
So the other thing that we're focusing on is combining some of these targeted agents, these new agents that target specific pathways with standard therapy. And the research models that we use include patients who have advanced disease, what we're trying to prevent, cancer that may have spread beyond the confines of the breast to other parts of the body. And we're testing standard agents alone or in combination with new agents or new agents alone. We're uh, adding new agents to patients with locally advanced disease where we give treatment, usually with chemotherapy before surgery to try and shrink the tumor. Um, and then look at the response in the breast tissue as, um, as a surrogate to see if we can identify certain agents that can enhance that response. And then we have other trials that we're just uh, beginning to uh, explore, so-called window of opportunity trials, where we give a patient who's scheduled to have surgery a, um, sorry, that's my phone. Um, uh, we, we give them the drug right before they're scheduled to have surgery without necessarily a therapeutic intent. And we're trying to determine um, whether or not the drug has any biological effect on, on the tumor. And so one of those drugs that we're using uh, are called HDAC inhibitors. These drugs sort of work by opening up the DNA. And if you could think of the DNA as a slinky, they um, open up the DNA. And um, for some reason, this makes the uh, cancer cells more susceptible to many of the drugs that we use. And um, in order to prove that, there are some patients who have allowed us to biopsy their tumors before and after therapy. And what we can see is these are what, what are called Western blots, and we can measure certain proteins. And the important point here to, to see, and we look both at the tumor and in their blood cells, is that we can dramatically downregulate something called AKT, which is a signaling molecule, which is driving the growth of the cancer cells. And this is after only three doses of, that, of one of those HDAC inhibitors. This is a drug that's not, it's approved for other types of cancers, but not breast cancer. And so what we're doing in collaboration with Dr. Montgomery and her group, and in collaboration with the radiologists, uh, are treating patients with locally advanced breast cancer with standard chemotherapy, uh, plus this uh, new agent called Varinostat, um, and then tailoring a the therapy based on whether it's triple negative, they just get chemotherapy plus uh, Varinostat. If it's HER2 positive, they get um, chemotherapy plus a specific anti-HER2-directed therapy called uh, Herceptin or Trastuzumab, and then they have surgery. And what we're trying to do is to improve the, com the ability to completely eradicate cancer cells from the breast as our readout as to whether or not adding this drug is really making a difference. And this will greatly accelerate the process of trying to identify promising new drugs so that we, we don't have to do a phase three trial that takes 10 years. Finally, um, to identify who really is benefiting from treatment, we, um, you've seen an example of defining molecular signatures uh, before, but we're using these also as, as a way of discovering new targets, but we're using these also to identify who benefits from specific therapies. And so we use primarily two factors to identify who benefits from therapies. One, uh, we use what are called prognostic factors. So this is a feature that's associated with a clinical outcome irrespective of treatment. So these include a large size of the tumor, multiple positive lymph nodes. These would be features associated with a higher risk of recurrence. But they don't tell us who benefits from therapy. And then uh, we have predictive factors. Uh, these are features that predict benefit from a specific therapy. And uh, those factors include the expression of the estrogen and progesterone receptor by the tumor cells, which indicates these patients can benefit from hormone therapy, and we can reduce the risk of recurrence by one half. And that this occurs in about 50 to 60 percent of all breast cancers. For the 15 to 20 percent of tumors that are HER2 positive, um, they benefit from anti-HER2 directed therapy, and their risk of recurrence also is reduced by 50 percent. But you can see for chemotherapy, we really don't have good ways to identify who benefits from therapy. And the benefits are actually quite modest in relation to the, some of the other therapies. So one way uh, that this has been addressed has been to develop a, a, a multi-gene assay that looks at the expression of a panel of genes. And when one uses this multi-gene assay, it provides more information that can be provided uh, by the, um, our usual clinical characteristics. And so in this particular group of patients who had estrogen receptor positive lymph node negative disease, who overall had about a 15 percent risk of recurrence, we can identify based on this so-called recurrence score, which measures this, the activation of these genes, that you can identify these patients into three different groups, one of whom has a risk of recurrence of 7 percent, another 14 percent, and another 31 percent. And then for a specific recurrence score, as you move to the right, you can pick out a specific 
risk of recurrence. So this is really truly individualized and personalized prognostication. Not only that, but it was shown that only the patients who had the high recurrence score seemed to benefit from chemotherapy. So rather than uh, a 3 to 5 percent benefit from chemotherapy, in other words, treating 100 patients to benefit 3 to 5, if we restrict our therapy only to the one-third of patients whose tumors had a high recurrence score, we're getting 25 percent benefit in that group and not any benefit in the other groups. And this is what this looks like if you plot the side as a continuous variable. So this is what the risk of recurrence is for patients treated with endocrine therapy alone who have an estrogen receptor positive tumor. This is the benefit from chemotherapy. And it's, you're starting to see uh, some benefit at a recurrence score of 11. Uh, and then and at 25, uh, the benefit is higher. But still, there's no statistically significant difference between these two groups, these two curves. And the cure rate within this group is 95 percent. So to address this issue, um, we embarked our, the cooperative group that I mentioned, ECOG, and basically every group uh, in North America uh, embarked on this trial called the Taylor X trial, where we took the, the group of patients who fell in that mid-range group, and we asked them to participate in the study and to be randomized to the standard of care, which is chemotherapy plus endocrine therapy plus endocrine therapy alone. It took about four years, but the trial completed its accrual goal of 11,000 women, and in about uh, five years, we should know whether or not chemotherapy is beneficial for those who have a mid-range recurrence score. If we prove that it isn't, as we believe that we will, then we will spare the need for chemotherapy in about 20,000 women in the U.S. Um, in addition, if we don't, we think we've identified a factor called TOPO2, which can identify the patients who have uh, an intermediate recurrence score who are destined to have a recurrence. And this is work that we've done and it's been published that shows that if you look at those patients who have a low or intermediate recurrence score, these patients would normally have about a 5 percent risk of recurrence overall for the low risk and about 10 percent for the intermediate risk, that by adding the information uh, to TOPO2, we can identify those who are destined to relapse and those who, who are not within this group. And so we may be able to, by making this a 22 gene panel rather than a 21 gene panel, we may be able to greatly uh, improve the accuracy of the test. And then finally, my entire focus has been on the tumor. Well, what about the host? Um, next week at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, I'm going to present some information showing the, uh, this is information taken from the, ver the very first study that I showed you showing a benefit from Taxol. We found that obesity was associated with a higher risk of recurrence. This is the relationship between increasing body mass index, and obesity is, is considered defined as um, a body mass index of greater than 30, that there is a linear relationship uh, between uh, increased risk of occurrence in obesity and increased risk of death. And you can see the risk of death uh, is greater than the risk of recurrence. So not only are obese women more likely to recur, but they're more likely to die of their disease if they recur. And um, what was fascinating about this and what, and what was new about this observation is that we saw this specifically in ER estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative disease, the most common subtype of breast cancer that occurs in 60 percent of all women. Why is this important? Uh, and what's causing this? We, we think what may be causing it, we hypothesize that insulin may be driving this uh, feature because we know that obesity is associated with high insulin levels and that high insulin levels are associated with increased risk of recurrence and that estrogen receptor positive tumors uh, express higher levels of the insulin receptor genes. So that we think, we hypothesize that high insulin levels are driving this and we plan to um, uh, initiate some additional trials to try and uh, dissect this out. And we're fortunate that we have one of the world's experts, Dr. Howard Strickler at Einstein, who's going to help us uh, dissect out this, uh, this, this question. So to conclude, um, I've just sort of given you a snippet of, of some of the things, uh, some of the contributions that investigators here at Einstein, so, starting with Dr. Horowitz, have made to the management of breast cancer. Uh, our scientists and clinicians have played pivotal roles in the discovery of Taxol and similar av agents. Uh, in optimizing their use in clinical practice. You could see our efforts in terms of developing new therapeutic approaches and to understanding not only the factors of the tumor that drive recurrence, but also host factors that are associated with recurrence with an aim towards per, uh, a better personalizing and individualizing our therapies. Thank you very much.